speakers and then um, your site will introduce the oops. Yep. Okay. Okay, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm Jonathan Yap from the uh, National Heart Center Singapore. And today uh, we are really pleased to be able to conjoin the session between APSC as well as uh, QICC. I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, Professor Liu Xian Bao, as well as uh, Chen Jin for inviting us uh, to give this session. And they will be my co-moderators today. Today we will have a very exciting lineup uh, on structural heart uh, interventions. We'll cover a breadth of topics from TEVI, microclip to LAA closure. And uh, we will have both uh, sessions on uh, evidence-based uh, data trials, as well as uh, some practical case sharings. So I hope uh, that this will be a very interesting and uh, informative session. Um, to get, today I will have with me as uh, discussants, uh, Dr. Jack Chan, as well as uh, Dr. Gopi, uh, from Singapore and India, respectively, to provide their inputs during the discussion. So without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Purik from uh, Central Chess Institute in Thailand, to give us the first talk, and that will be on the latest trials and guidelines for transcatheter aortic valve implantation. Purik, over to you. Uh, thank you, John, for a kind introduction. And I would like to thank you, APSC and uh, QACC, for in inviting me for the real lecture today. So, uh, the title will be a latest tar and guideline for TAWI. So, uh, I have nothing to discuss. So, this is the scope of my talk today. So, I think now is the everyone used the uh, to guideline ACC, Paula had this is guideline and EAC all had this guideline. And in Thailand, we also have a uh, Thai Thai guidelines as well. So I will focus on these uh, three guidelines today. So first for ACC 2020, all this guideline, patient with LTC Every case will uh, have a hard well team with discussion for surgical AVR and Thai and share decision-making with patient. So they divide patient to go first, the patient who high or prohibitive surgical risk, which defined as STS more than 8%, priority more than 2 And uh, if their life expectancy and quality of, with acceptable quality of life more than one year, the patient will consider to do the, the target. If not, so palliative care. And for other part, uh, which uh, not a high risk for surgery, they divide patient that the patient can uh, on VKA or not. If they can on VKA and the age less than 65, mechanical valve is preferred. And if they are more than uh, 65 years old, so they consider to use a biopositic valve. And then this part, uh, they also divide the patient into three groups. For the patient at more than 80 years old, Transfemoral therapy is preferred over surgical AVR. Transfemoral therapy is class 1, surgical AVR is a 2A. But 65 to 80 years old, surgical AVR and therapy recommend at the same level, class 1. Okay, so ACC uh, begin with a uh, compound. ACC begin with compound to VKA and H less than 65, go for surgical AVR, mechanical valve. More than 80 years old, TAVR prefer over surgical AVR. ESC 2021, Wawa divide the patient like this. So if patient have a symptom and ejection fraction less than 50% and intervention likely to be a benefit, so they will do the intervention. But for the patient that asymptomatic, asymptomatic CVAS, they will do exercise that test to confirm that the patient to be asymptomatic or not. If uh, to be asymptomatic, they will re-evaluate again every six months to, to uh, discuss with the patient again that they have to do anything or not. And the uh, other thing that uh, if the patient have a symptomatic ejection fashion less than 50% exercise that test positive for symptomatic CVAS benefit from intervention, they divide patient into three groups. First is more than 75 years old, 
a suitable or highly sponsored car area and suitable for type 2 law therapy, so they continue to do the therapy for patients. Less than 75 low risk search for AVR. Other patient or other patient minute ABH, they will have a hard team discuss that the patient might suit well for surgical AVR or TAVI as well. So ESC is more than 75 years, probably TAVI or, and they have other clinical characteristic factor that favor TAVI and surgical AVR as shown on the table. Uh, like a uh, Patient who have a higher surgical risk favor TAVI, older is favor TAVI, and anatomical and postural factor. They are sequelae of chest radiation, porcelain aorta, high likelihood of severe patient positive mismatch, like ABA low compared to a body surface area, they prefer TAVI. And this one is uh, another thing that uh, like a low calorie height, and uh, it's not favorable to do TAVI, so we send the patient to search called AVR. Okay, and for Thai guideline, Thai guideline, it uh, so in in the the conference and in the committee, so we try to gather the information from the ESC and ACC and try to adapt it to to uh match with the Thai people. So we begin with age more than eighty years old. And if the patient have a life expectancy more than one year, or the patient who risk factor high for surgical, so we send the patient to surgery. So more than 80 years old and inhibit to do the surgical AVR, we send the patient to surgery. But uh, for patient lower than that, so we divide into the risk like SDS score less than 4% and our 4 to 8%. We look for the patient as, as well. If the patient is 20 to 80 and the leak is uh, low to intermediate, we link the transfusion and surgical AVR as class one together. However, for age less than 20 years old, in Thai guideline, we prefer surgical AVR. And there are the table that look like the ESC guideline to make the physician uh, easier to discuss about which patient favor TAVI, which patient favor surgical AVR. Like this, for sure, porcelain aorta, sequelae of chest radiation, patentary artery bypass scarf. Uh, the patient have a history of a open chest wall before we favor TAVI. So some lines from T guideline according to age. I think uh, Thailand look like ACC, we prefer more than surgical area in age more than 80 years old, ESC is more than 75 years. And uh, for surgical AVR, we prefer in ESC is less than 75 years, ACC 65, Thailand less than 20, no TARVI. Uh, except that the patient prohibitive for, for surgical AVR. So next, Interesting try this year, 2020. Uh, this year, I think they have a lot of try that are very interesting, but due to lack of time, I, I bring uh, two try that I think it might interest. Because now they, uh, in Europe and USA, they perform TAVI in low risk patient more and more. And we all know that the duality of TAVI is still like a five to seven year. So if the patient order like expensive, longer the patient might do the, the TAVI again. So I look into the low risk try of TAVI, which uh now say we have a four major try, metonic low risk, partner three, UK TAVI and notion try. And for the metonic low risk and partner three that have an industry sponsor which prop 10 years, which quite long time. So that uh less than five years we might look into the Motority and the recurrent MI, but for more than five years, we can carefully look into the wall duality. So it's the both of the tie is quite good. For partner three low risk tie, they have the outcome at five years that launched in TCT this year. Then no mice of one thousand with low risk or uh, low risk for surgical AVR. They are no mice to TAVI and surgery and. This year, five years outcome show that uh, uh, in terms of uh, date late, seem that the uh, TAVI have a 
higher than that compared to the second year. So it's uh, quite opposite at one year. One year looked at the uh, TAVI better than surgery. But however, from the result, they explain that because uh, during the, the COVID time, unfortunately, uh, TAVI in this study, TAVI patient in this study, did more than surgery. So it's uh, quite unpredictable during the, the COVID time, the TAVI patient did more. But when you look deep into the CV cause of death, they saw that TAVI and surgery at a five year is look alike almost the same number, eight and nine. And for the, some patients have a traumatic head injury from four as well in Tavi and uh, have a cancer and COVID and sepsis dead in Tavi. So that explains why the, the Tavi led mortality catch up the, the surgery led at uh, five years. But the diff, if these are different results in Euro low risk trial for yearly results this year, so they randomized uh, the patient with low risk CV, uh, low risk for surgical into ear using and uh, surgery using and the uh, result at four year show that um, the TAVI arm the TAVI arm look uh, better than the surgical AVR arm in terms of all cause mortality and disturbing stroke P almost significant at this point four year so you would try on our outcome uh, surgical AVR. However, in subgroup, uh, all cause mortality and this being still, still the same. All cause mortality lower in Eulut Tari. And uh, for the sub, uh, subgroup of a uh, segregation point in other point, show that all cause mortality, this being still, and aortic valve the hospitalization is lower already in um, Eulut Tari arm. Um, at four years, and atrial fibrillation is lower. However, in the uh, TAVI arm, higher rate of permanent pacemaker implantation. So due to lack of time, my take home message, all three guidelines begin with surgical leaks and age. How we use hard team to decide for patient, no well match or no, uh, is have to decide with the patient and cousin as well. Indication for TAVI was expand to low surgical risk, patient with poor missing result. Lifetime management is by damn shit in AS. Okay, this one. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thanks, uh, Purik, uh, for the excellent uh, lecture and uh, taking us through all the evidence uh, for Tevi. Uh, for next up, uh, just to follow on this uh, session um, lecture, we have a more practical uh, session uh, by uh, Professor Chen Jing, who's going to share with us uh, her most uh, challenging TAVI case. And we will have a discussion after this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thanks, QICC, and thanks, thanks EPS ESC invitation. Um, today, I will share um, since our studies is about the TAVI treatment of severe aortic valve regurgitation. Um, now it's not this career. So this is um, uh, 81 years um, old man and uh, suffer, um, suffers a recurrent acute um, heart failure for several years. Uh, almost three years ago, he has um, diagnosed with a severe pure aortic re uh, regurgitation and with persistent atrial fibrillation and uh, cerebral infection, hypertension, and uh, Parkinson's disease. So uh, this old man has several uh, severe combination. And uh, from this physical examination, the uh, aortic um, pressure is very low, which is also indication for the severe um, aortic, uh, uh, rec um, aortic regurgitation. So this is an laboratory examination, and uh, there is a moderate uh, uh, anemia and uh, the platelets number has been decreased with a very high level of NT problem P. And also the uh, New York um, Heart Association uh, classification is about three grade. And uh, from the echo um, cardiography, we see there is enlargement of the aortic um, artery and LAD and LVDD. And also with a very long term of the um, 
left ventricular heart failure, there is increased of the pulmonary uh, artery systolic pressure, and also the LVF has been decreased about 45%. So from this echo, we see um, there is very severe aortic regurgitation and with the uh, uh, degeneration of the leaflets, um, this is a poor alignment and result in resulting the AR. And the mitral regurgitation and the tricuspid regurgitation is mild to moderate. So before the tally, we see from the ECG, this patient has a atrial fibrillation with ventricular escape rhythm, um, which means that the potential dysfunction of atrial ventricular node. And this is also the high uh, risk for the pacemaker in the future. So um, for the uh, AR patient, first we will detect the CTA from the whole cardiac uh, cycle. Um, this is a sinus of the venous vessel diameter is too large. And the STG um, diameter is about 41 millimeter and, and the distance is high. The, and the aortic of artery, the average the diameter is uh, also about nearly the 41 millimeter. Um, but for the left and the right uh, leaflet, and the height is very high, so there is no risk of the coronary um, obstruction. So this is a root, root angulation is a 61 degree, and so this is a transverse heart. And there is a, um, a little um, calcification um, in the left uh, leaflet. And other leaflets, there is no um, sickness or the calcification. So uh, next, we will uh, determine the annulus and the LVOT size. So for the um, cystonio and the del diastonio, the parameter of the annular size is stable. Um, is a uh, range from the 84.2 uh, millimeter. Um, but uh, uh, below the annulus, we will detect the from the two for six millimeters. We see um, the LVOT two millimeter and the LV and the LOVT four millimeter. The parameter is from the 83 millimeter to uh, 84 millimeter. But below the six millimeter, the LVOT is abruptly enlarged. So the L so the L-curving um, site or the um, is only the annular and the LVOT two to four millimeter. This position is very narrow. And the um, peripheral vascular access and the aortic arch um, is good. So the device um, is easy to um, deploy through this the access. So um, for this uh, patient, um, the in our center, this is our procedure for the TAVI. Uh, this is a very old uh, man, and the STS um, score is about 9.6%. Uh, um, so it's very high. This patient is an indication for TAVI. But in our center, we also attend the CNAR trial. And uh, also this uh, anatomy is uh, and the anatomy is good for the criteria. And this patient was randomized into the TAVI group. Here is a um, uh, see this AR trial um, in detail. This trial is uh, um, is supported by the uh, is a PI is a Nanjing First Hospital is a Jun Zhejiang professor, and this is a self expand valve in the treatment of severe um, pure AR, and uh, we will include about two hundred and ten percent of this patient will be uh, randomized into. Uh, TAVI group or medicine group with the uh, following up and one year, the primary endpoint is all cause death, disabling stroke, rehospitalization for heart failure. And also, this is an uh, inclusion criteria. Uh, from this criteria, we can see this anatomy is very important. Uh, we could use the CTA or the 3D TEE. First, to confirm the annular parameter is less than 85 millimeters. 
um, and then the perimillimeter ratio of the LVOT four millimeter to annular wells from wells from the zero point nine five to one point zero five. So this so this anatomy is about the straight barrel shape for the uh, warm um, anchoring, and also the as it. And also this is a STS score is very high for the high risk of TV. So from this patient, we see the ratio uh, in systonic and their and the diastonic is about the is about one zero. So this is a um inclusion. So this is a on the inclusion criteria. After that, this is a, a procedure of TV. First, we will um Put the bottom of this uh, um valve just uh, a little below the um non coronary sinus, and all of this procedure is guided with the TEE. So this is the first releasing. You can see this valve is a um meter flow with a, a recycle um ability. And we use the cusp overlapping techniques. This is the first releasing. And uh, we can see the bottom of the valve is too high and is above the NNC from the um, detection with the TE. So it's very dangerous for pump up. So this valve is recycled again for the second releasing. And this time we put the um, valve um, deeper into the well AOT. But this time we see because this anchoring site is very narrow, we can see this um, valve has dipped into the ventricular. So we recycle again. For the third release of the valve, this is a procedure. From this um, procedure, we can see um, the um, position is good with the TE, and this is a final releasing position. And we check the TE again. We say uh, first, the PVL is very, very trace in trace. And from, um, and from this image, we see there is a curtain, is a muscle curtain. Here. So this is of the bottom of the valve. So the bottom of the valve, the distance between the NNC is about um, 8.5 millimeter. And also um, the valve shape is very good. So um, because this patient have the potential um, ventricular, uh, atrial and ventricular node dysfunction, so uh, we found that immediately after the TAVI, this patient e image, this patient ECG has occurred of the complete LB LBBB, and the QRS wave is widening to the 173 um, milliseconds. And uh, after six days, this patient has become to the three uh, degree AVB, and for seven days post heavy, we did a for the physiological pacemaker implantation. So this is when you're flowing up. There is no death, heart failure, readmission, myocardial infarction, and the um heart failure and the um heart function is very good, and the PVL is trace. And this uh, alteration between LAD, LVD, and PVL and LVF, we say. After one month and uh, until the one year following up, the LVF is increased from the 45 to the 50, um, 55%. And the LAD and the LVDD has been uh, improved. And also um, there is an improvement of the right heart function. So uh, this patient has been uh, continued with the following up. So for this patient, we know this is a very high risk of the pacemaker implantation because first, uh, there is a persistent uh, uh, atrial um, of aberration um, and also with uh, potential 
um, atrial ventricular node that's functioning. And also for this patient, because this is a pure AR, and uh, the deep of the valve is about uh, one uh, 8.5, and also the oversizing percent is uh, 50 percent for this patient. So this is a very high risk for the pacemaker. And also this is a acylase for the permanent pacemaker after TV. But we using the uh, physiological pacemaker for the patient and, uh, and the clinic um, following up is very good. So this is our case, thanks so much. Okay, th thank you. Uh, we have come to the panel discussion. Uh, any of my co-moderators or the panelists have, have any questions or comments uh, to make on the two talks that uh, we have heard? Maybe I can go first, uh, if okay, John? Uh, yes, sir, please. Yeah, so thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Chen Qing. Very exciting, uh, particularly for uh, isolated AR. Very difficult subset, and congrats to the Nanjing first group for starting this uh, again. So we'll wait to see a lot of results. I see in your selection criteria, patient preference is also very important. If patient refuse surgery, it's also possible to recruit. So I, I think that leads me to some remarks about bridge trial. It focused a lot on lifetime management selection based on, I think, an overemphasis on age. Uh, SCS score, I can agree, but I think patient preference was not much mentioned in a lot of the guidelines. It's more, almost as if it's a hard team discussion I decide for you based on reimbursement and stuff. But I think patient discussion is equally important. Can I ask Purich also, in the subset of end-stage renal failure with severe aortic stenosis, is there any studies uh, validating between surgery or TAVA for treatment? Oh, okay, sounds uh, so. Okay, yeah. Please. So, so, sorry, uh, Professor Chak, uh, ask about subset of what? Can you, can you ask again? Uh, sorry. N6 renal failure patients. In patients with on oh. dialysis, uh, if they have critical aortic stenosis, is there any studies uh, showing a preference or benefit of surgical replacement versus uh, TEVA? Uh, I see it's a good point, but uh, I, I don't have an in information in that. I, I never searched this before. However, for in my center for instead, you know, this is the result after TAVI is a uh, quite uh, worse compared to the non instead, you know, this is. So, so I, I, I don't have uh, data on that. Sorry. We have some uh, contemporary data from uh, Singapore, um, just published in one of the local journals that, um, I mean, as with uh, PCI, you know, patients with uh, advanced uh, uh, kidney disease uh, do worse than those um, without. Uh, but we have not particularly looked at uh, valve degeneration. I'll say that anecdotally, we know that end-stage renal failure patients, you know, their valves somehow, you know, subset of them, they, they don't last as long. Maybe I would like to, at this point, pose a question to uh, Professor Chen Jing. We, I saw from your valve that um, this is a self-expandable valve. Um, we know in China, there are some valves um, like the J valve and the uh, Yana valve that um, they actually have some clips to help to clip on the leaflet to help with anchoring. Could I ask for this particular valve? Um, did you have uh, any issues with pop-outs or how does it anchor in a patient without uh, much calcium? Okay, thanks. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we, we can hear Okay, you. thanks. Yeah, uh, because until now, there is no um, indication of the on-label uh, AR um, valve have been uh, indicated in China, including the Genova Vila valve. So for the high risk of the patient um, patients, uh, maybe several patients with uh, special anatomy can be indication for the um self expanding valve this uh, self uh, self expanding valve is a uh, vita uh, flow valve have the big size of the crown and uh, also for the patient for this the anatomy is very very important um means the ratio of the annular to the lvot is uh, uh, one 
uh, one uh, is literally the uh, one between the zero um, point nine five to one point oh five. So uh, from our experience, uh, there are at least two anchor um, sizing uh, is very position is very important, including the annular or the LVT and uh, LVOT. And uh, another important annular uh, si um, size is uh, um, aortic artery and STJ. In our experience, if the aortic um, artery is less than the um, 38 millimeter plus the STJ is less than the 34 millimeters, and also the annular uh, parameter is less than 85 millimeter um, with the recycling valve we can also access successfully to do the TAVI for such a very high risk of patient. Um, but uh, if in the future there is indication for the um, anchoring valve like the JVAV and the yellow valve, maybe um, we had more uh, trials to compare um, the TAVI with the SAVR in the uh, AR patients. In Singapore as well, we do not have any uh, AR-specific valve, so uh, that's a problem that we face. Maybe yeah. I just want chime in over here. So uh, about the topic of uh, ESRF and TAVI, uh, from our side, we have been looking at our own data. We've got about five-year follow-ups and looking at the groups with a high-grade CKD, four against five. For some reason, they have higher mortality as well as uh, cardiovascular outcomes, but for some reason, the valve durability in our personal experience has not been affected that much. But our population has only been about two hundred plus patients in our in our database, so maybe it's just underpowered. Uh, but I think anecdotally, definitely, we think that the valve degenerates faster. Uh, this one, this data has been presented as an abstract, but hasn't been written up yet. Uh, but I guess we'll be looking forward to present that. Uh, as for Prof Chen, uh, I, I'm really quite curious about this valve because I think, uh. Possibly, maybe I don't speak for all, but for myself, for pure AR cases, I always go in with um, fear. I fear that I come out um, a different man, uh, a humbled man. And so I, I just want to ask, what's your experience with uh, this the Vita Flow valve? Because uh, locally, we, we don't have access to several valves. For example, my valve, and they recently published a paper showing pretty good results with pure AR. But even then, a 97% success rate, they have a 3.5% embolization rate which is very scary because I, I kind of don't want to ever see an embolization in my life. So I've been using mainly the self-expanding Medtronic platform. So may I just ask, uh, in your experience, uh, for this VitaFlow platform, what is, uh, what are the, what's the success rate like and what's the embolization rate uh, like, especially, uh, of, and of course, a pacemaker, knowing that this population is really hard to deal with? Uh, actually, um. For 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 the um for for the since AR trial we have done the since they are the registry uh, trial before, and we include the about the um seventy nine um uh, seventy nine patients for the pure AR with a uh, uh, self expanding valve. Uh, the primary endpoint is about the mortality and the readmission of the heart failure and the disability and uh, dis disability of the stroke. Actually, the uh, rate is about, uh, uh, is, um, is similar to the TVT, TVT results, but uh, the pacemaker rate is very, uh, is relatively high. It's about the um, 20, uh, 22%, nearly or 22%. As we know from the yellow valve um, clinical trial, the pacemaker rate is also very high. So. Uh, we don't know um, for the pure AR, the pacemaker rate also is a, a problem. Um, even uh, in the with the anchoring um, valves. So uh, I don't know how to um, face to the problems in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe I have uh, one last question uh, for Professor Liu uh, Xianbao. You know, well, we heard from uh, Purik that uh, in Thailand they have a kind of an age cutoff of 70. Um, in the ESC guidelines, they use a cutoff of 75 and you know, ESC has a soft cutoff of between 65 to 80 for age for TAVR. would like to ask, you know, in China, is there a particular age cutoff that the uh, Chinese doctors use or, you know, or they look at the patient in general as a whole and 
age doesn't really come into play. Okay, thank you, Professor Yap. Yeah, so you know, in China, there's no rules for the age cutoff. So I think usually in right now, in our daily practice, we usually, I think over 65. Yeah, so so this, I think this experts consensus about that. So however, there are some, uh, I think just one or two patients, very, very young patients, about 50 or 40. So the patient don't want to use the warfarin. So then, so one or two patients we use the tower with the saving three short valve. So maybe for the lifelong management, we will use the tower in tower or just the, I think maybe at a 60 or 70 years old, maybe suffer with the, the prosthesis, not the mechanical valve. And then 10 years later, 80 or 85 years old, so maybe tower in suffer. So I think, yeah, for, for this kind of patient, I think just in in China right now, uh, there's a trend. Yeah, some patients want to do that. So but that's a very interesting point raised. Uh, <laughs> each each patient we have to consider them individually and you know we plan for their whole lifetime uh, yeah. uh management. Maybe we'll switch tracks now then go on to our second uh, half of the session. And uh, next up, uh, we are going to switch gears and talk about uh, percutaneous age-to-age repair. First up, uh, we have uh, Dr. Lim Ming Hao from National University Heart Center, Singapore. And he's going to talk to us about the guidelines and evidence of uh, transcatheter age-to-age repair for mitral valve. Uh, Ying Hao. Hi. Uh, thanks, everyone. So again, I'd like to thank everyone here, Professor Jack, Professor Jonathan, and, and uh, Professor Liu, and Dr. Professor Chen for inviting me to this conference. Uh, I would much rather be over there with uh, with the crowd, but I guess uh, Zoom will do, uh, since I can't be there. So I've been uh, asked to present the guidelines and evidence for uh, mitral transcatheter uh, edge to edge repair. And I think that I might have overdone it a bit. So I've got too many slides, but I'll try to just go through the brief points of uh, each trial and, uh, and the guidelines. Um, so I'm from National University Heart Center, Singapore. Uh, we're not to be confused with the National Heart Center, they are the heart center per se with a younger brother or, or small brother to them. So I shall not try to pretend we are, we are higher volume or better. Uh, I do structural intervention in uh, NUHCS. Uh, so there's a U in the middle, not NUHCS. And this is the scope of our work within uh, the structural team over here. And the uh, specific talk here will be about mitral TER, which is one of the things we do. Um, so what we will not cover today will be uh, everything else that's not edge-to-edge -edge repair. We will not talk about the transcatheter mitral valve replacements um, or the other repair methods through indirect annuloplasty, direct annuloplasty or cord repair. I think if we, might go, go, if we go through that, I think uh, we might take a day and a half and then maybe a bit more. So uh, the mitral transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair devices out there on the market currently about three. The granddaddy of them all will be the Abbott system, the mitral clip. And this is the one that kind of started the TER revolution uh, that's still going on to try to it right now. Uh, Pascal joined in the fold, I think probably 1819 or so. And then of course, um, not to be beaten, uh, Valgen has had a dragonfly system since uh, I think a few years ago, for some evidence. But of course, the bulk of the evidence is with mitral clip um, because they've been on the market longest. But I think we can safely extrapolate to think that um, this edge to edge repair would work and would have similar effects as long as it's uh, successful in reducing MR, regardless of the system that you use. I don't think there's anything super special. So the mitral clip, this is the evolution of it. It's uh, now in the generation four. In the fourth generation, now you have four different sizes of clips. Uh, they're long and short and fat and skinny. And more importantly, the individual leaflet capturing is more is the most important, and you get LA pressure monitoring as well. The mitral story started with Everest One, which was a proof of concept. But over then, uh, then in two thousand and nine, only seventy four percent success rate, and this was some of the criteria that uh, probably many here will be uh, familiar with in terms of uh, which patients should undergo this. Everest Two was um mitral clip versus surgery, and not necessarily high risk, just anyone who goes for surgery. And essentially, they proved that mitral clip is safer in terms of outcomes. So you can see that major adverse events is about half or maybe a third of their surgery, but the success rate in terms of the primary endpoint for mitral valve dysfunction um, or death is about two thirds of surgery. So it lost to surgery in terms of efficacy, but it's got better safety outcome. 
And as a bit of premonition, you can see over here at, at, for the subgroup analysis, you see that the patients with functional MR, employee EF and older, so absolutely your secondary uh, MR group of patients, uh, they do benefit more with a percutaneous approach. So even in 2011, I think there's some foreshadowing of the evidence that's to come in the future with the quiet trials. So Everest high risk was a single arm for whoever was rejected from the uh, for, from the, the mitroclip uh, Everest cohort and showed that in a high risk cohort, uh, you can get very good results with a uh, majority module or less MR at a 12 month mark. So in these patients, they improve in terms of function, MR reduction, as well as volumes. And then now we're going to come into the the two trials that everyone loves the most, Mitral FR as well as COAP. And everyone knows that Mitral FR and COAP showed very disparate results. Um, they were released in the same edition of a New England Journal. I think the editor was being a bit naughty to put them side by side and release an um, editorial comment as well about uh, why they're disparate. So Mitral FR in short uh, recruited uh, French patients, 450 of them, with uh, functional MR. And this is the ERO and LVF cutoffs, but there was no difference in death and heart failure between these two groups. But COAP was a very different outcome with about 600 patients. Uh, this was an American trial. And in terms of heart failure and death, there was a very disparate uh, outcome between the device group and control groups. So over a two-year follow-up, you get um, about a 40% reduction uh, of death you know, for the patients who undergo went mitroclip versus control group and heart failure hospitalization uh, as well. I think uh, in excess of uh, 20%. So that's so that's very disparate, and some people shout uh, maybe industry um, involvement, but I guess the calmer minds uh, presided and they decided that to look at it sharply. And what we've realized is that the, these two trials, although they started functional MR, they're quite different. So quiet patient had a bigger ERO, bigger regurgitant volume, as well as uh, the volumes of the LV were less dilated. So less burnt out LV and a greater ERO or greater leak. And what that really proves to you is this concept of a disproportionate or proportionate MR, where essentially you're asking, is the MR really that bad relative to how big your LV is? So COAP patients have a big ERO and a smaller LV EDV. Mitral FR patients have a smaller ERO and a bigger LV EDV. So they're proportionate and they don't respond as well. And that's what we know from uh, this COAP and uh, Mitral FR story. And the reason why I go through all this is because all these criteria have really advised and guided the guidelines in how we synthesize and how we advise patients. So I guess this backstory, although it sounds long-winded, is quite important as well. So coming on to the, the second brother here, uh, Pascal. Pascal came about from Edwards. Um, so Pascal is slightly different from MitroClip system. There are only two clip sizes. The Pascal Ace came out slightly later and it's got a thinner spacer. The Pascal system is um, it's, it's trademark is that there's a spacer uh, between so that you can reduce a residual MR between the, the clip arms. Uh, there are only two sizes, uh, and apart from that, the closure mechanism is just slightly different. So in the initial CLAF study in 2019, it showed efficacy in reducing uh, MR from severe or moderately severe to I think the majority, the bulk of them had one plus MR, maybe over 80 plus percent with an NYHA functional group uh, class improvement. And the class 2D, uh, the degenerative group, uh, just released results last year. We showed uh, pretty excellent results. So in class 2D, uh, Pascal went head to head against MitraClip. And in these studies that uh, you showed, you can see that at end of six months, which also their interim analysis cutoff, uh, you get about 83% mild or lesser MR in a Pascal group. And the MitraClip group would be similar in number. So both groups uh, showed pretty good results. If you include the moderate group, it's about almost 98%. So mild to moderate MR at end of six months, which is a fantastic result for both Pascal and Metroclip. But in doing so, they have uh, kind of proven that Pascal is at least non-inferior for the degenerative group. Uh, Pascal 2F uh, is probably going to come out sometime soon, but I don't know exactly when, but I guess everyone will be hoping for results for that. And then here we come in with Dragonfly. Uh, Dragonfly is a, is a bit of a mystery to me because I, I have not really seen the device before, but I have uh, seen presentations of it. So Dragonfly has a spacer in the middle and four sizes, a bit like uh, the MitraClip G4 system. Um, in EuroPCR this year, Scott Lim just presented some uh, data on it, uh, but the full paper is not out. So the pivotal study that was just released, it's supposed to be released this year. So N equals 120, degenerative MR3 plus to 4 plus. Uh, and 
at the end of one year, um, the, the primary endpoint is reached in about 88% of people. Uh, and that's really mortality, surgery, and above moderate MR, which is a reasonable result. So but I'll be looking forward to seeing more data for this uh, in the future. As the data has come along and we've been advised about um, how, how patients should be managed. So here we come along with the European guidelines. Um, these are the most recent ones in 2021. So patients with primary MR usually would get a valve repair as much as possible. However, if they are a high-risk group, much like with the average high-risk or prohibitive cohort, if they're anatomically appropriate as per your Everest guidelines, or sorry, your Everest um, qualification criteria, you can offer a transcatheter edge to edge repair. And for patients with secondary MR, um, you see that now a referral to the heart team and GTMT optimization, including CRT, is very, very important. Because part of the difference between COAB and mitral FI is really that the COAB patients had better GDMT optimization. So despite optimization, despite PCI TAVI, and despite all that, the patient is still symptomatic and still appropriate for valve surgery. If the, if the valve looks like it would do well with uh, mitral clip or TER, uh, you can offer them that. So those are for the Europeans. For the Americans on the other side of the pond, their latest guidelines from 2020, um, for primary MR, it's the same thing. It's a two-way indication to go in for patients with primary MR for a high or prohibitive risk. And again, this, for patients with secondary MR, you need to have GDMT supervised by a heart failure specialist specifically. And this is a class one recommendation, which is really strong. And really, that, that is impactful because it tells you that, you know, part of the benefit in COAP is that really the heart failure specialists have, are managing the GDMT rather than ad hoc or willy nilly. So despite optimization, if you know, if you still have persistent symptoms, then if the anatomy is favorable and you can realize from these uh, numbers here, this is exactly co inclusion criteria. So if it's a very co like cohort, you can uh, have a two-way indication to recommend for transcatheter edge to edge repair for the mitral valve. So since these guidelines have come out, uh, some other papers have come true. And so namely co five-year outcomes. Uh, some people have wondered whether the outcomes would uh, taper and then meet together, but it seems to be sustained over a five-year period. So death as well as heart failure hospitalization, the curves are, seem to separate and you don't really rejoin anymore. So that's uh, very promising for TER. The Xpand G4 was a registry study for 1,100 uh, patients who undergo on uh, MatchClip G4 and it showed phenomenal results. So at the end of one year, 93% of patients uh, can get can sustain a one plus MR or less. And that is really quite incredible. And for patients with primary MR, about 89% can sustain one plus MR or less. And of course, there's a sustained improvement in uh, functional class status as well. So this is this does show that these results and the TER works um, and it has a lasting results. Two other smaller studies that I found uh, important to me was MitraTune, which just came out this year, which is in a specific group of atrial functional MR. It's a small cohort, 87%. Uh, so atrial functional MR patients underwent undergoing MitraClip with a fairly elderly age. Majority are successful, and you can see that um, with uh, MitraClip, you can reduce the atrial size as well as the LA volume and the diameter of the annulus in all dimensions. And MitraBridge is another one because we, so far we've talked about patients who are stably well, so mitral bridge studied a cohort of patients who are, have bad, bad, bad heart failure, advanced heart failure, either on a transplant list, heart transplant list, or bridge the decision or bridge candidacy with a functional MR. So just 120 patients. And you would expect for this group of patients that because they're so sick that many would die. So over about one and a half years, truly about 10% did die after mitral clip. But you can see that up to about 20 over percent, they actually get withdrawn from the list uh, for heart failure transplant. So that's quite remarkable that you can do a clip uh, for a patient who's on a tr heart transplant list and get them off a transplant list. And that to me is impactful uh, for this N equals to 27. So in conclusion, um, I think what we learned from all these TER trials is that so to ensure good outcomes, you need to really know who you're selecting, which patient to, to select for. And we can see increasing role in evidence for TER even in all kinds of complex cases, whether it be atrial functional MR, sick patients, heart transplant patients, or complicated anatomy. And with uh, novel technologies and new TR devices, I think the edge, the envelope we push further, and we can only hope for to get better and better outcomes for our patients.
So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for attention. And uh, that's my summary of all uh, my trick clip or TER trials so far. Thank you. Thanks, Ying Hao. It was a very comprehensive uh, run through of the trials as well as the guidelines. Uh, we'll keep the discussion for the later half. And uh, next, I would like to introduce my co chair, uh, who actually needs no further introduction, uh, Professor uh, Liu Xianbao, who will share with us uh, his most challenging uh, clip case. Okay, thank you. So, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so today I'd like to share a very challenging case uh, performed by Professor Wang and me and our team together. Yeah, just that we finished it, I think only two, about two months ago. Yeah, the patient is 69 years old gentleman. The patient has the history of chronic uh, renal insu insufficiency and chronic pulmonary fibrosis. Yeah, and the patient has very severe symptom over three years and aggravated for one month. Yeah, I, about, I think about four years ago, the patient had come to me and uh, we did a echo for him. You can see right here, very severe, uh, the MR, the DMR, just like barrel. Yeah, so because the patient is the borrow, the mechanism is borrow disease. So at that time, we suggested him to the surgical department and the coronary is okay. So however, the patient, the, 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 it's still very high risk for the surgery at that for even four years ago. So the you can see right here, the pulmonary, yeah, it's not good. Yeah, very severe, the situation. So the patient, because of the surgical risk, so the patient that re refused the, the open heart surgery, even for the less invasive, the uh, the mitral valve replacement, and with no regular follow up in the past three years, yeah, and uh, ten days ago the patient suffered from the acute, acute the heart failure with very severe chest tightness, short of breath, yeah, and the patient cannot be able to lie down at night. Yeah, we can see right here, the BMP very, very high. Yeah, so we check the TT again. Yeah, much more severe than before. Yeah. So the, the TE and the patient can, the, the patient cannot lay down, we check the CT for him. So we can see right here, it's a very severe situation. This is the EKG. And after 10 days, yeah, after 10 days, the in the hospital treatment, the pulmonary, the situation is much better. So however, still the patient have very sim severe the symptom. The patient cannot lay down and feel the chest tightness. Yeah, the situation is not so good. So for this patient, we have the MDT several times. So just to focus on the treatment. What should we do for this patient? So because of the patient, the mechanism is borrow disease. So it's very difficult for us to treat the patient, the anatomy like this, use the trans catheter, just uh, use the tear. So for us, we we, we just uh, invite the, the surgeon, cardiac surgeon, and the experts of the lung transplantation and discuss together. So is that possible? We can do the surgery, to the open heart surgery, or the just the less invasive to treat the, the, the mitral valve. So we don't know the pulmonary situation is good enough to do that. Or is that possible we can do the lung and heart transplantation yeah, at the same time? Yeah, so after the MDT, so the they just uh, refused to do the lung and the heart transplantation for this patient. And also from the cardiac surgeon, say because of the severe situation of the pulmonary, so they don't want to do the open heart surgery for, for him. So 
just to save the patient for this aspect. So we talked to the family several times. So they can accept the failure of the tear procedure. So we can just try. Yeah. So we so we just uh, at the table, we just do once, check the TE and then prepare the matter clip device uh, to the bedside, then we do the, the procedure together. So we don't want to the patient to have several times of the intubation or extubation. Yeah. So we can see right here, yeah, very severe, severe regurgitation. And then we can see here, this is the A1, P1 right here. We can see right here, very severe prolapse. And the gap is very big. And this is the A2, P2. Yeah, we can still see the flare right here. And then the A3, P3. Yeah, still we can see the prolapse right here. So the prolapse is very wide. So this is the 3D echo. We get very, very severe regurgitation. So it's very challenging to that. So we just uh, want to try. So we'd like to use the, the XTR. So we, the plan is to use the two to the XTR. And then we, to do the puncture of the, the septum. And the puncture side is good and uh, is high enough. And then we use, use the, the, put the, the first XTR in the three. Yeah, in the A3, P3 right here. This is the orientation, yeah. Although the anatomy is challenging, yeah, so just for the three, A3, P3 area, it's not so difficult for, for me to grasp the leaflet. So then we release the first XTR. Yeah, we still can see some regurgitation at the M. And then we put another one just beside right here. So at that time, we just uh, discussed that is, if that is possible, we just move a little bit to the lateral and just use the two. Then we tried. Yeah, however, they're still they are very severe residual MR, so it's not acceptable by the by two XTR. So then we open the clip and then move closer to the first one, and then we 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 will use the third one. So we change the plan. Yeah, fortunately, yeah, we the the, the two clips closer and the, the reputation is much better. Yeah. And then we put the third one. Yeah, very close to the second one, side by side. Yeah. So we can see right here, there's still some regurgitation. So however, it's much better. And this is the final result. Yeah, and the gradient is good. And the pulmonary vein, the, the rotation is good. Yeah, so just after the procedure, the patient feels much better. Yeah, and the, we extributed the next day. Yeah, the, the pulmonary situation is not affected by the procedure. Yeah, the patient, after just one week, the patient just charged and go home. This is the one month follow up. There are still some regurgitation. So however, the, the patient feels good. So we saved the patient. And then the patient will go to the 
the the the the pump the respiratory the respiratory department and then to evaluate it to the pulmonary the transplant the lung transplantation to evaluate yeah i think for this the this kind of strategy we can save the, the patient so so for the short term result outcome it looks good okay this is my presentation thank you so much well, Prof Liu, I must uh, applaud you for this case. I think the strategy is absolutely spot on for, for this case because I think some people might be tempted to go in for an XDW right down the middle. Um, I think based on this case analysis, it's quite clear that with a bar low, uh, often if you put down a clip down the middle, you will have a prolapse through uh, around the valve and you get eccentric leaks all around. And if you have to put in further clips, uh, either medial or lateral to it, you might end up dislodging the clip. The XTR specifically actually has some data for uh, damaging the leaflets um, in the G4 series. So I think uh, your strategy is spot on. I think it's absolutely something I would agree with. So upfront multi-clip strategy using XTR, not W, so that you don't uh, increase the gradients too much and you staple medial to lateral, which I think is, is absolutely what I, I would do as well. But most of the time, I wouldn't want to do a balo anyway. But if I had to, I think that is the absolute correct strategy. Because otherwise, um, I've had bad experiences in trying to struggle to put a clip through the medial or lateral orifice and you end up damaging the leaflets or tearing it and the patient might end up with a worse MR than, than start state. So I, I think I would applaud you for this, a very brave case. I, I Personally, I don't think I would have wanted to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So, you know, we don't have the G4 system in, in mainland right now. Yeah, so we only XTR and TR. <laughs> no choice. Oh, I oh there's, no, there's no W clip. <laughs> Yeah. So, however, so you know, so the dragonfly system, so this is the domestic made. Yeah, already approved by the NMPA. So they have the four sizes, long, long and short, narrow and wide. Yeah. I was expecting you to demonstrate the power of, power of the dragonfly system in your presentation. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Could, could I ask um, Professor Liu, you know, like having used the both system, the Dragonfly as well as the um, Nitro Clip, uh, are there any differences um, between both systems and when would you use one over the other? Yeah, so so I think the Dragonfly system, so I don't know you, you you already see the the device or not. So I've heard of the presentation. Yes, we've no? seen some presentations, but um, we have never got to use the device, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the design is similar, quite similar. Yeah, so so just some changes. Yeah, I think there's some innovations. So they, there's a spacer. So can I share? I, I, if possible, I can share the, the another slide. <laughs> you can have a look. <laughs> so do we have time? Yes, yes, we do. Okay. So just a minute. Yeah, I, I have a slide to share in the... TCT meeting this year. Yeah, so so I will share share the Yeah, this is the dragonfly system. So there's a uh, the fill filler right here, yeah, to decrease the the, the tension of from the leaflet, and also there's you, you can see right here, the stabilizer is different. There's a knob right here, and also there's a, a readable parameters right here. So the angle right here, so we can see very clearly. So 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 we can adjust the system, yeah, very precisely, yeah. <laughs> so this is the different, the, this is the the clip design. Yeah, I think that the mechanism is quite, yeah, quite quite the, the quite similar, yeah. And also they have the characteristics of the real time LAP monitoring, independent grasping and the four sizes, uh, in the cetera. And also the system can be used uh, for the TR. So, Prof Liu, uh, when would you choose like a, for example the dragonfly over the mitre clip? Or is there any yeah. specific thoughts in your in your head for which patients are better for which? Yeah, so I I think so similar. 
we can choose the device similar. So for this case, if we the, we can use the the, the Jalanfis system, I will use the, the long and wide. Yeah. I would have thought the spacer will be advantageous, such much like with the Pascal, because you have less tension on the leaflets, so less likely to uh, injury the leaflets as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yes. So that subset with the spacer, I think, is really a very good advantage, particularly for like the atrial fMR subset mm -hmm. that you presented. I think that's the most useful. I think a few comments are beautifully done and. Uh, Professor Liu and uh, Dr. Wang basically demonstrated the fact that tier technology is quite mature at the moment. In experience, hands, I think it works in very challenging subsets. And we are definitely not doing A2P2 all the time. Lah. It's yeah. mostly everywhere else. And uh, this sort of subsets, uh, more and more operators are uh, doing actually with fairly decent results with quite good reduction of the MR. Um, I think the hard team approach is really quite crucial, like what Dr. Liu demonstrated in such a challenging subset. It's very difficult to not have a hard team, good hard team actually, and a, a discussion about what to do uh, with support and then bail out as well. Uh, we comments about uh, using XTW versus XT plane uh, in this subset. As we gain more experience, especially in Singapore, the G4 system, we are using predominantly a lot of XTW rather than a standard XT, even in the A2P2 position, as long as it's not really right the commissioner. Uh, we think that it does get a lot more leaflet than, uh, in, especially when it's floppy. I'd like to congratulate the team because I saw your imaging is amazing. Even after two clips in, uh, the echo images are so clear and beautiful. I think that's really the limitation for this uh, technology once you need to use more than two clips. A brief comment about um, in-house lectures. Very comprehensive. I, I, I love the way it took us through. Uh, my thoughts are that we often talk about co-app and neglect the mitral FR, but I think the mitral FR is very useful for pointing the way to say what subsets not to do as well. And maybe with the progress in heart failure treatment, a lot of the secondary functional MR are doing pretty okay in that in the mitral FR group that uh, I think in this day and age, maybe medical therapy alone is probably okay, good enough. The proportionate and disproportionate MRPs, I also like the conceptual concept, but a lot of people say that you shouldn't use that as a conceptual concept. I, I feel that maybe it's easier to think of it, the disproportionate group as, although it's supposed to be a secondary MR, more like a primary valve problem that it fix actually they do very well. And the secondary true uh, proportional MR is a really an LV failure group where they will probably benefit from upscaling of uh, LV uh, support, whether vet or transplant. So, um, but but great great data. I think the other subset that we're also seeing increasingly in this space for tier is that of concomitant mitral and tricuspid disease. And then deciding whether, and more fun to do, whether you do it uh, one side and wait and see or do both sides at the same time. So a uh, very exciting space. Uh, thanks. Uh, Thank thanks, Professor Jack. So I think I must uh, agree with you. So as people say, um, an, experience, an experienced operator knows how to do all cases, but the most experienced ones know when to not do the case. So I think um, have this mitral FR really informs us which cases will not do well. Uh, no matter what what you do for them, and really, it really go, goes to point out that it's whether it's a mitral valve problem to begin with, or whether it's an LV problem. So I I do I do resound with what you just said. So we will move on to the uh, last segment of our session, and uh, in this session we are going to actually talk about the bit, bit another structural heart intervention, a uh, LA closure as well as uh, some uh, thoughts uh, on uh, imaging by Asman. So I'll give the uh, talk on um guidelines as well as uh, trial updates on uh, LA closure. Share my screen. And then that will be followed by uh, Asman's talk. Uh. Okay. So um, just to show, this will be what I'm going to cover later. Um, there's a brief introduction to the LA closure, some of the landmark LA trials, a 
a summary of the guidelines and a little bit about perspectives and uh, future um, trials. So we all know um, the CHATSVA score. The higher your CHATSVA score, the higher your stroke risk. And the part that I would like to emphasize here that this risks that are quoted in these numbers here, for example, CHATSVA of 3 and a risk of stroke of 3%, these are annual risks, meaning that you have a recurrent 3% risk of stroke every year. This is not a lifetime 3% risk. And um, many studies show that um, the mortality and morbidity associated with AF strokes are very high. And uh, if we anticoagulate them, we reduce their stroke risk, but we all know that this comes with bleeding risk and the bleeding episodes come with morbidity as well as mortality. Of note, uh, guidelines recommend using the HESBAT score to re-stratify your bleeding risk. And if we compare the CHATSVA score with the HESBAT score side by side, we can see that there are, there are many uh, variables that are similar. So uh, if you look at um, hypertension, age, stroke, they're all similar uh, between the chest bars as well as okay. the head bars. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, could... Now, heart pumping could you mute? Um... Thank you. Yeah, so basically, if you have a high head bars score, you will have a high chest bars score. And so, you know, the higher your stroke risk, the higher your bleeding risk. And so that puts us in a conundrum. So many years ago, about 20 plus years ago, this was a autopsy study. They looked at... Uh, where all the LA clots in AF patients came from, and they found that more than 90% of the clots originate from the left atrial appendage. And so the idea came about that, you know, if you were able to close the left atrial appendage, reduce concomitantly reduce your risk of stroke. And now in this day and age, there are many devices on the market. I know that in China, there are much more devices, but I would say internationally, the most commonly used two devices are the Watchman, and of course the updated version, the Watchman Flex, as well as from Abbott, the Amulet. This is a summary of the timeline of um, anticoagulation, trials, as well as guidelines. As you can see, you know, warfarin has been here since the 1940s. And only in the early 2000s, we started having the DOEX. If you look at the trial-wise, you know, most of the randomized controls trials started coming only in 2012. That was the, started with the PROTECT AF trial. And the guidelines-wise, um, so far, there are very few, and the latest being the ESC guidelines in 2020. So that's where we are at the moment. And I would like to today cover just the three important randomized control trials that have been published. And I'd like to emphasize that, you know, in this field so far, only there are three uh, trials that have been published. You know, there's really quite a lack of uh, good um, evidence. The very first of them was published in the early 2009, and this was the PROTECT AF trial that randomized the uh, Two is to one for Watchman versus Warfarin. They followed the patients up for 18 months. And in this initial trial, the conclusions was that the left atrial appendix closure was non-inferior to Warfarin. However, I would like to highlight in this box that the periprocedural risks were very high. We had 5% of the patients having pericardial infusions, 3.5% major bleeding, 0.6% device embolization. And because of that, the FDA in the US did not approve the watchman uh, for LA for reduction of stroke risk in AF patients and required them to do another trial. And so the previous trial was kind of like a very similar trial to the PROTECT AF trial. It was uh, published about five years later. Very similar design. They randomized two to watchman, one is to warfarin, and followed them up for uh, 18 months. At 18 months, the primary outcome of stroke, systemic embolization, and cardiovascular death did not reach non-inferiority, but the stroke and systemic embolism on its own did reach uh, non-inferiority. Of note, the primary safety endpoint in this previous trial was 2.2%, uh, much lower than that of the PROTECT AF trial. You know, as the operators get experience with using this device, the safety of the procedure uh, improved and uh, there were much lower periprocedural complication rates. So, if we were to combine the PROTECT AF as well as previous trial, the data, and we follow them up, follow the patients up, up to five years, that's where we start to see some interesting data. At five years, there was comparable stroke reduction between the um, warfarin as well as the watchman group. And this, there was also lower hemorrhagic stroke, bleeding, and mortality. If we look at this uh, summary uh, table, the line in blue shows the expected uh, stroke risk 
uh, by a, by the chest vas score. So the higher your chest vas, the higher the stroke risk. The red line shows the expected stroke risk if you take morphine. And the little dots that you see there are the different uh, watchman trials that show that, you know, by um, doing this uh, procedure, you kind of reduce your stroke risk to that similar of um, anticoagulation. In the last couple of years, a newer device, the Watchman Flex has uh, replaced the original Watchman device. This device is a lot uh, better. If you see here, it's a ball-shaped device rather than a, a sharp edge device in the original uh, iteration. So this ball device makes it a lot safer, uh, less risk of uh, perforation of the left atrial appendage. The coating is better, and there's also um, the hub is also more flush, so less risk of device um, related thrombus. And in the initial uh, uh, trial, uh, this kind of just a single arm trial, they found that the primary safety endpoints, so all the complication rates was very low, 0.5%. And the effectiveness and procedural success rate was almost 100%. Having had the chance to use this uh, device myself, I will say there's a big jump on the original Watchman 2.5 uh, device. This is the last randomized control trial that I'm going to talk about. You know, people say, hey, you know, you compare um, warfarin with uh, LAA closure, but you know, nowadays everybody uses the DOAC and there's less dealing risk with the DOAC. So, you know, is there still a role of a left atrial appendage closure in this current EVA? So the PRAC-17 randomized control trial uh, randomized the uh, patients with a uh, DOAC versus uh, LAA closure, about 400 patients. In this uh, trial, 95% of them are on the Pixaban. With regards to the device use, two-thirds was amulet and one-third was watchman. Just to summarize, you know, the primary endpoint of uh, stroke, CV death and bleeding was similar in both the DOAC as well as the LAA group. And this is the breakdown of the individual uh, components of the primary endpoint. And you see, as you can see, there was no uh, significant difference between both groups. So um, our local study group actually looked at the literature and did a meta-analysis of different uh, studies comparing LAA closure versus uh, DOAX. And just to say that we kind of found very similar results in terms of mortality, we found a uh, that uh, the mortality actually favored LAA closure. And uh, MACE as well. This includes stroke, bleeding, as well as uh, death. And now we come to the guidelines. This is just one page on the two major guidelines, the ACC as well as the ESC guidelines. They are very similar. I would like to say that currently in the guidelines, is a 2B indication for LAA closure. And this must be in patients with AF and increased stroke risk we have some contraindications to long-term anticoagulation. Um, the caveat is this is a contraindication to long-term anticoagulation, not contraindication to anticoagulation. Because for these devices, most times you need a short period of uh, anticoagulation while these devices endothelialize. This is a summary of the other guidelines that are available uh, from the American College of Chest Physicians, our own Asian Pacific Heart Rhythm Society, from uh, New Zealand, Canada, Europe. Just suffice to say that you know, they all fairly state the same thing that you know that LA closure can be considered, but you know, it should be in patients so who have some form of a high bleeding risk or contraindications to longer term anticoagulation. I would like to just quickly comment on one of these uh, perspectives that uh, John Kemp just uh, published a couple of months ago uh, in Europace. And um, this is some very, very interesting data. If you can see, you know, the randomized control trials that have been published are very few. Reviews and meta-analysis very few, but you know, there's an explosion of data in the LA space, LA closure space. A lot of registry data, a lot of um, uh, cohort kind of studies that have been published. And we all know that um, guidelines are based mainly primarily on randomized control data and um, Whereas consensus and guidance documents allow some of these, um, if I may, you know, less strong evidence to be used. For us practitioners in the field, you know, we have seen also an explosion of cases of LAA closure uh, done. And you know, some people comment that you know it's time maybe for the guidelines to catch up with what uh, daily practice uh, is about. In my last couple of minutes, I just want to highlight uh, two upcoming trials. So just a quick one, there's a Sky Consensus. You know, you, you guys can read it. it. Just got published a couple of months ago. And once again, you know, very similar recommendations. 
um, this is the kind of uh, anti-thrombotic therapy that's recommended. For the Watchman Flex device, it recommends uh, either six weeks of anticoagulation or you can even use the APT. The, FA, uh, the FDA has approved that. For the amulet, you can use the APT without anticoagulation. Most recommend a TE at six weeks to assess for leak. And if there's leak, you know, you anticoagulate for longer. So this is my last couple of slides. Uh, I just want to highlight uh, one very, two very important trials. So now there are two randomized control trials comparing LAA closure with DOAC. And they are the Champion AF trial. Uh, this is using the Watchman Flex uh, by Boston. Uh, as you can see here, the idea behind it is that, you know, if you're on DOAC, you have a consistent or anticoagulation per se, your bleeding risk is constant every year. Whereas if you go for upfront device, does that help you in the longer term? Of note, the follow-up uh, for all these devices, uh, these trials are about four to five years. You know, they think that you need a bit of extended period of follow-up to really see the benefit of uh, going for this procedure because the, the bleeding risk is not absolutely uh, very high. And so this is the Champion AF trial for the Watchman Flex. And likewise, there's a similar trial catalyst using the amulet. And uh, these trials are going to be part, the results will be probably available in 2026, 2027. So we eagerly await uh, the results of this trial. Thank you. I'm just going, we're just going to quickly transit uh, to our next talk before we have the discussion on uh, uh, my talk as well as the imaging talk. And uh, next up, uh, I would like to really um, have this pleasure of uh, introducing a close friend, um, Dr. Asman Sharif from uh, Malaysia. He's an interventionist as well as an imager as well as heart failure. So he does, he's really multi-talented. And he wrote uh, one of the uh, consensus statements uh, on uh, imaging, instructional heart interventions. And so no better person to give us the next talk on the role of echocardiography in structural heart interventions. We, we know how important imaging is. Asman, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep, we, we hear you. Great. Uh, so I'll just share my slide. And uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I think uh, I have to do everything because I'm forced to do everything, unfortunately, in Malaysia. Uh, but uh, echocardiography is a passion of mine, and hopefully I can share uh, a few uh, thoughts about uh, the role of echocardiography in transcatheter structural intervention. So my name is Isman from Malaysia. I have no, uh, nothing to disclose. So the outline of my talk are as follows. Uh, I'll discuss first on why echocardiography is actually important in this uh, field of structural intervention uh, before going on to you know, how we ensure competency in this uh, particular field of interventional echocardiography and then sort of ending with some pretty pictures because no echo talk is you know complete without uh, pretty pictures. So why echocardiography? I think uh, without doubt everyone knows that you know echocardiograms, uh, echocardiography is fairly portable versus uh, MRIs and CT scans. Imagine doing you know a periprocedural uh, assessment of a valve disease using an MRI versus actually having the ability to do it uh, while the patient's on the table. Uh, with the interventional uh, colleagues uh, alongside you. So uh, one reason would be its portability. Unfortunately, there's a flip side to the portability is that uh, with uh, time, we've realized that uh, the radiation exposure to interventional echocardiographers is actually quite high, a uh, hundred times more than the interventional cardiologists themselves. Uh, but fortunately, I think uh, with this realization, as well as you know, this field being a booming field, uh, there are more and more devices being developed uh, to sort of uh, circumvent the problem of radiation. The second reason why echocardiography is fairly important is it provides real-time imaging. And I've got three different stories here to tell you guys. So one, if you can see here, is a case of a TAVI uh, that was implanted fairly low. So it was done without TOE prior. You can see there's this whole chunk of calcium on the aortic root all the way extending even to the anterior mitral valve. And they had unfortunately implanted it a bit too low. And because of that, the native aortic valve had caused the prosthetic aortic valve to sort of become wide open. So there was torrential severe acute AR and the patient actually went to an arrest. The way they dealt with this was they had to do a valve in valve. So they planted another tabby at the top and uh, the patient was then well. Um, the other uh, usefulness for real-time imaging is this case. So we actually were doing this case of an AFD that we planned to close. 
But unfortunately, from due to some lag in time, not enough heparin, there was actually some thrombus in transit that was detected. And so we had decided to abandon the case. Uh, this would not have been possible if there was no uh, sort, of, sort of echocardiography imaging done at the time. And the third one was actually a case post um, pavy procedure, uh, immediately post pavy procedure. So the patient uh, turned out fine, but what the echocardiographer had noticed was a slither of uh, pericardial effusion. And although it's small, the patient actually ended up in tamponade. And then we, uh, without, again, the echocardiogram, we would have not noticed uh, this uh, cause of the pericardial tamponade. And the reason for the tamponade was the patient's safari wire had actually perforated the left ventricle. So uh, echocardiography actually is fairly important because of this. And I think a step forward with regards to real-time imaging, now we've got fusion imaging as well, which sort of combines various forms of modality. So echocardiogram, CT scan, also your fluoroscopy uh, to better appreciate uh, the structure of the heart and the valves. So the third reason why echocardiography is important, it inverts the need for contrast. And we, I, I think as uh, discussed by Keurig uh, uh, earlier about aortic stenosis and you know how, how common it is in end-stage renal failure patients, sometimes you don't want to give that extra dose of contrast because of the renal impairment. And we can do a good job with echocardiogram with multi-planar reconstruction right now uh, with how to measure, with regards to measuring the aortic annulus, the root, etc. Um, this, however, is uh, a bit of a, uh, I, I guess, a warning really. So in this case, this institution had tried to do uh, measurements of the aortic analyst using a TOE, but as you can see, there was also a mechanical mitral valve replacement in, uh, done a long time ago. So then they decided to do CT scanning for measurement, and unfortunately, as you can see here, the way they've measured it is fairly wrong. And why so? It's because this particular institution had not done CT scanning uh, fairly routinely. So this is just a bit of a reminder that um, it's not that echocardiogram is to replace CT scan or vice versa, but really it's about using both approaches and using one approach, one modality to check balance the other to make sure that your measurements are correct. Okay, with this growing field with regards to interventional echocardiography, I think we're quite fortunate over the last two years that there's been multiple standards, guidelines, and uh, consensus statements with regards to how best to achieve competency. And I think the Americans have done a good job uh, telling us you know, how you go from level one all the way to level three from different routes, uh, both cardiology and even anesthesiology. But the one thing that people have to bear in mind uh, with regards to uh, this field of interventional echocardiography is really, it's not just about the skill sets that you gain and what you read in the books. It's also making sure that you have a conducive environment and a conducive faculty that can provide the means of doing uh, enough echocardiography to fill in your logbooks and to be level three trained appropriately. Okay, so this is the third portion of my talk. I think this is the more fun part, I guess, uh, all the pretty pictures. So just some examples with regards to echocardiograms, echocardiography in structural intervention. So I'll start off with the mitral valve. And the first thing when we think about when it comes to the mitral valve is mitral clips. However, we need to remember that the first, one of the earliest interventions with regards to the mitral valve is actually this, which is PTMC or PMDD, uh, depending on where you come from. And uh, echocardiogram serves many roles, uh, pre-operatively or pre-procedurally, peri-procedurally, uh, as well as post-procedurally, you can see here. Using 3D imaging that we have now, we can better appreciate the morphology of the mitral valve. Uh, in this case, it's the nautic mitral valve with commissural fusion. We can also use other modalities such as uh, bipane imaging uh, on the left atrium, left ventricle, as well as the left atrial appendage, as has been discussed uh, by John earlier, to better appreciate the dimensions, alongside using 3D reconstruction as well. I think this is the most important sort of development following, you know, the advent of uh, 3D imaging as well as uh, multi-planar imaging is where you really puncture with regards to the interatrial septum when you're doing a procedure with the mitral valve. And you can see here, uh, sort of put different crosses. So the white cross is where we normally want to do or normally want to puncture for PTMC, whereas the black would normally be where you do for a mitral clip and the blue most likely for an LAAO or left atrial appendage occlude, uh, occlusion procedure. However, it does vary according to your patient's anatomy. So again, just a reminder of how um, echocardiogram or echocardiography is useful with regards to the mitral valve, uh, PTMC specifically. Uh, it helps with confirmation of the degree of stenosis as well as regurgitation prior. Uh, you also evaluate the safety of the procedure. 
you get to evaluate with 3D the annulus of the mitral valve, uh, you get to guide your transeptal puncture and your wires and catheters across, and more importantly, post-procedurally, immediately post-procedure, you get to monitor for complications as well as success of your procedure. So now we go on to the other mitral valve problems in mitral regurgitation. I think it was eloquently uh, discussed uh, earlier by uh, my colleagues. Uh, and we've moved away from just simple 2D TOE imaging. Really. We've got 3D imaging to help us guide whether this is a primary mitral regurgitation, as, this, as shown here, or something more of a secondary mitral regurgitation with a large annulus. Um, as uh, kindly, as, as, as wonderfully demonstrated by Prof Liu earlier, you can see as well, uh, with regards to this patient, uh, you can de decide the degree of, of severity of actually the Barlow's disease or fibroelastic deficiency. We all know it's a spectrum, and uh, the more to the right the spectrum is, uh, the more difficult it is sometimes to sort of click. So that uh, 3D imaging can help you decide. There are other things that we sort of take into consideration now, knowing that TER is uh, a favorite, uh, including things like commissural flail, which can be very challenging, although there have been reports of successful TER with commissural flail. You've also got uh, multi-planar reconstruction here to better delineate and better draw out the uh, orifice of the mitral valve, as well as, a, I guess, a new appreciation of the posterior mitral valve leaflet, especially when it comes to clipping the mitral valve. There's also a new appreciation for Doppler as well, despite all this uh, new technology, 3D and whatnot, uh, especially palm leaf vein, uh, which I think any uh, interventional, uh, interventional cardiologist would know when doing a mitral clip. It's normally what we use to decide whether it was a successful clip or not, as well as the LVMT stroke volume. So these are, this is just a table, uh, sort of uh, helping guide really whether it's going to be feasible or not so feasible with regards to clipping your mitral valve. And other parameters that we look at includes flail width and flail gap. However, I think as uh, discussed by Ying Hao earlier, we're sort of moving towards really clipping everything. Well, as long as we set our minds to it, because uh, the devices are sort of growing to adapt to our needs and uh, our wants really. So again, this is just to showcase some beautiful 3D pictures. Uh, where you puncture in the interatrial septum really depends on where your lesion is. A more medial lesion needs a higher puncture and vice versa. You use 3D to guide your catheter through uh, the interatrial septum as well as through the mitral valve and throughout the clipping procedure. I won't go through this too much. I think uh, it's uh, sort of discussed uh, far earlier already. I'll just move on to tricuspid valve. And I think, uh, if anything, the valve that has gotten the most attention was once the forgotten valve. Uh, you can see here, many, many more devices have been built over the last few uh, years, really. This is just a reminder that the, unlike the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve is fairly complex. Uh, we all know from the Rekker Hans uh, paper that the leaflets can go up to eight leaflets altogether. So a deeper appreciation and a very thorough interrogation is needed, really, before you decide on transcatheter structural intervention. You also need to remember that there are many corridors, there are many other apparatus alongside just the valve uh, that you need to take consideration as well. And this is where 3D is very helpful because it gives you uh, beautiful images mimicking that of um, in vitro. Sometimes you're fortunate, we can do uh, trans uh, tricuspid imaging via transthoracic as done here by our team. But most of the time, we're not as fortunate and therefore we still rely on transesophageal echocardiogram to get this particular view, which is a transgastric view. And I think most interventional cardiologists would know, especially those dabbling with uh, triclips, that this view is paramount. Although this view is not uh, the only view that you need to sort of also appreciate, but definitely uh, one of the more important views. And it's not just about the morphology of the tricuspid valve. I think it's also important to appreciate that when you're assessing severity of the TR or tricuspid valve echo, especially for intervention, you want to look at some treatment-oriented multiparametric assessments, so annular dilatation, the panting height, the panting volume, coaptation gaps, etc. So some examples here include coaptation gap. Ideally, it should be less than four millimeters, and it can be a bit challenging, although not impossible if it's more than seven millimeters. Leaflet length this, uh, depends on the kind of uh, device that you plan to use. You also want to know whether the patient has device needs. Uh, you want to also assess the caudal structures as well as the evidence of calcification. And we all know that there's now a new severity score, uh, five uh, different levels of severity when it comes to the TR, uh, to sort of uh, go hand in hand with transcatheter structural intervention. 
So this is really just a sort of whistle stop uh, that we had uh, written uh, based on our state of our review on how to sort of guide your uh, triclasmate valve PR procedure using TOE. But just so that people can bear in mind, that was just for PER. Uh, when it depends on which triclasmate valve intervention you're looking at. For example, on the far left uh, is the pay clip, which is an annular uh, uh, device uh, that's used. Uh, there are other considerations that you have to take into account, uh, both on TOE as well as things like uh, looking at the RCA to ensure patency. And on the far right is uh, the trick valve, which is a bicable uh, heterotrophic uh, valve implantation, in which case some might argue you might not need a TOE for this, or you can get away with uh, intracardi echocardiogram for this. But we found this, uh, we found TOE to be quite useful for this procedure to assess for the uh, positioning of the, uh, the stents. Okay, so the next valve is really the aortic valve. I think, unfortunately, uh, over time, we losing using less and less of echocardiograms for aortic valve implantation, TAVI specifically, uh, because of probably service uh, service pressures with regards to trying to create daycares for TAVI and whatnot. However, I like to remind people that uh, echocardiography still remains a very important tool when it comes to aortic valve assessment, specifically for complications such as uh, what's shown here, paravalvular regurg, prosthetic mig prosthesis migration, and also annular structure. And the other thing to remember is, yes, CT scan is now fairly gold standard when it comes to the measurement of the LVOT and the whole aortic root. However, you need to remember that the previous data was used or was uh, pit against 2D imaging, now we know that our 3D imaging is fairly superb and it actually goes head to head with um, CT scanning. Uh, however, it's not that I'm trying to pit them against each other and you're supposed to replace one over the other. You should be using both modalities again to check and balance each another. And just a reminder, MDCTs, they're not without their risk. They have radiation risk, contrast risk, as well as uh, you're unable to use them or you're only able to use them pre-procedurally, whereas TOE, you're able to use them uh, without radiation, without contrast, and also periprocedurally. And this is also another, I guess, severe complication of TAVI if you're not careful, especially when there's a lot of calcification, which is called the Mount Fuji sign. You can see as the TAVI gets uh, deployed, the LA roof suddenly starts to tent, and that can cause aortic root rupture. So again, uh, in certain cases, certain patients, uh, you may still want to employ TOE, and patient selection is key. Again, uh, with regards to the aortic valve, uh, there are several roles of TOE uh, to determine annular sizing, uh, valve deployment, heart, annular injury, coronary flow, etc., and also complications. Uh, just really one slide for each of uh, the other structural interventions. So ASD, uh, we had done this case uh, recently, uh, quite successfully, without any general anesthesia, and that's because of this uh, new N9BTD uh, GE probe, which is a pretty much a pediatric probe with the capability of 3D and uh, also multi-planar reconstruction. And uh, I think this may be one of the few things that will drive uh, the use of TOE and procedures in the future. Uh, the other thing is with regards to left atrial appendage occlusion, and now we are seeing more and more cases of uh, using intracardiac echocardiogram or intracardiac echocardiography eyes uh, with regards to the procedure itself. Although it does depend on which uh, catheter you're using, uh, there is a bit of a learning curve, but nonetheless, um, something that can definitely be learned. So conclusion, uh, I've used this uh, central illustration from our paper to really sort of hopefully uh, delve into the main point of my talk. Um, we have many transcatheter structural interventions at this point. Um, what we do need though, however, is to ensure that we can maintain the use of uh, echocardiogram in these uh, procedures and really it uh, depends on three things. Uh, ensuring that we are up to date with our echocardiographic cardi modalities with regards to structural intervention, making sure there is a way to ensure competency in this field. And just like this, um, this, this, uh, this, this conference as well, ensuring that there continues to be regional networking uh, with regards to structural intervention. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much for uh, two speakers' wonderful speech. And uh, as we know, the cardiac imaging has been widely uh, used in the clinical practice, including the uh, valve and other interventional uh, techniques. So uh, please, uh, after to um, the discuss, uh, do you have any comments from our panelists?
Uh, maybe I can start off. Hey, Jonathan, can I ask you a bit of a naughty question? Um, yeah, sure. You, <laughs> you, you can't say no, right? So, <laughs> so have you, uh, what are your thoughts about LAA device closure for patients who, with uh, valvular AF, rheumatic AF? Have you done any and what's your experience like? Um, I will say that I don't have much experience at the moment um, um, because where we come from, you know, we kind of um, still follow very strictly to the guidelines and um, I feel that the rheumatic kind of um, valvular kind of uh, MS and all that, they are kind of a different kettle of fish. So I'm not so sure that just by purely closing off the LAA per se, you know, you actually reduce your volume of clots because you know if your MS is kind of still there you know your, your flow in the whole LA is not good could still have a uh, clots formation so you may not totally um, uh, get rid of the problem so I will say that you know I, I think this group of patients still will need uh, anticoagulation for now and um, till we have the evidence to show otherwise. Um, I actually have a question again it's for John because I've just been wondering really um, mm. Yeah, you, you've sort of highlighted all the evidence quite nicely with regards to left atrial appendage occlusion. Uh, and we've, we've seen quite a remarkable turn, really, from where it first started, you know, and then having to do more trials, etc. And that brings me to the, to the you know, to, to this, this thinking of um, how soon should we be doing clinical trial for structural intervention, knowing that there is a bit of a learning curve when you first introduce a new device, per se. Uh, do, 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 do you have an answer for that by any chance? Or? So, so I would say that uh, for centers who are recruiting um, for some of these clinical trials for these new devices or for uh, some of the existing devices, they actually look at the center's uh, experience. Um, basically, they will want you to fulfill a minimum criteria um, of X number of cases uh, before they will recruit you uh, to join their trial. I think everybody is concerned and all of us as interventionists, as procedurists, understand that uh, in the initial period whereby we, we start the device, there is a learning curve that uh, will be hard to avoid. Uh, yeah. But once you once you have this baseline uh, amount of experience, then the amount of learning curve that you need to learn a new device, obviously there's some, but that shortens quite a lot if you already have some pre-existing uh, transcatheter uh, skill sets. Uh. Uh, not not a question, but uh, I heard an uh, excellent, uh, excellent talk. So I have one case for Stavi and the uh, are we perforate from the Y sub Y as well? So that that time the echo guy helped me a lot. So that time we we confused uh, how frequently efficient come. So may I ask just one question, Esman? So do can we uh, different uh, the frequently efficient when we do the Tavi from a uh, why safari perforate or uh, the tempest perforate? Like are we perforate or are we perforate from echo? I, I think a uh, good question actually. And uh, it's very difficult. A diffusion is a fusion. You can never know where it comes from. But the best thing to do, and that's why Tavi is, in, uh, I, I guess echo is important Tavi, is you do the peri or pre-procedural echo and you take note whether there is an infusion to begin with. And the minute there is an infusion, something has happened. There's no reason for an infusion to happen. Uh, right after. So I, I think it's it's as straightforward as just having an, enough pictures prior to know what was your baseline. And uh, if something deviates from the baseline, you, you do need to just be a bit wary. Plus the fact that my patient had, uh, you know, had went to uh, cardiac arrest and all that, uh, needing, needing a, uh, needing a, well, pericardiologist was enough of a sign that it's, it's because it's new. Yeah. One quick uh, comment uh, to differentiate between the RV and LV perforation if you have yeah. a pacing wire and, the, and you also have your uh, heavy wire. Most times you are in tempo nut, you have to do the pericardial synthesis. If on hand you have an eye stat, you can send that blood for uh, SP for oxygen saturation. Yeah. You know, if your oxygen saturation is more arterial blood, then it's LV. If it's more like venous blood, then maybe RV. But that's just one of the tools that may help. So Adam, I still uh, have a question for the tricuspid uh, uh, tier. As we know, the TE is very uh, important, but very difficult to get the clear image from tricuspid tier. Techniques do um, have some experience to improve these uh, skills, or do we have the new, for example, the eyes can be uh, applied yeah, uh, using the tricuspid uh, tier techniques? Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I agree. I think ICE has really come a long way from its first uh, iteration till now. The pictures are more crisp. You've also got 3D capability now and multi-planar reconstruction as well. Um, and it's also much easier for the patient as well, logistically. Um, I, I think we, we, won't get, we won't get away from the fact that we still need transgastric and that, that can be a bit tricky and people, it's again a learning curve, especially for a young fellow who's not done uh, that many. Uh, the, the only way around that is really experience and to get into the lab really, but I, I, I don't see any other views coming in line. ICE would be uh, one way forward. Hey, Esmond, I really enjoyed your talk because, uh, you know, I started as a TE guy before I did structural intervention. Yep. So it was a real pleasure to see all your very beautiful pictures. And if every procedure was guided as with such nice pictures, it will all be half an hour cases. Uh, so uh, for tricuspid TER, right, I'm, I'm going to say that um, the TE is so important that that there have been reports of uh, gastric ulcers as well as burns uh, from uh, TE from uh, tricuspid intervention. So I, I'm not sure whether TE is completely benign. And I've also had uh, patients with mitral valve and valve come out with a, so like an acute uh, bleeding GIT uh, post-TE. So I guess all is in the hand of a, of a good operator like Esmond. Uh, as for this ice, I must say that it's very tempting in the field of uh, tricuspid because when you put in an ice probe, it's really right beside the tricuspid. Yeah. But yeah. I personally feel like the 4D capability is, is critical because yeah. perhaps it's just me, but I'm not that good at manipulating the left, right? So I think without 4D, I really wouldn't dare to do a triclip um, without, um, with, with just uh, the 2D capabilities. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, uh, again, learning curve with regards to the uh, ICE, but you're right as well. Uh, it is not benign. The thermal damage that happens to the esophagus has been reported. It can be quite severe, actually. Uh, all sorts of fistulas being formed even long-term. Uh, again, ICE, even this new 9B, uh, 9BT BGE probe as well, is, is where we're headed, uh, you know, as minimal as possible for the patient, as comfortable as possible for the patient. Hopefully, it picks up. A quick comment on the ice. Uh, I think for the tricuspid, two uh, D ice is not the way to go. Um, we definitely need the three D ice so that you know you can have both three D imaging as well as X plane. Um, uh, it's crucial. I think in Asia at least we, I mean at least Southeast Asia, you know we don't have the luxury of having that device yet. Uh, we hope that uh, such a imaging tool will be able to come to us soon. But I think it's good. It looks like at least a year to two years. Uh. Chen Xing, uh, in China, New York have a uh, three D ice uh, probes. Um, to use for um, structural imaging? Uh, actually, the ICE has been um, start, has been started to use in the uh, electric, electrical um, uh, interventional yeah. techniques and uh, has not been widely used uh, until now. And also for the tricuspid tail, um, the only uh, some of the very big, uh, the several very big centers have been studied. Uh, as uh, based on our experience, we think the uh, most difficult is to how to get the clear um images for the futures uh, interventions. So this is I, I think this is still need the learning curve for the um, learning and practice. Maybe in the future the eyes maybe have uh help us to improve these uh, techniques. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, I think the time is uh, nearly ending. Um, P Professor Jackson, could you please give us uh, closing remarks for this session? Thanks, uh, Professor Chen Jing. Um, first, uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, QICC for doing such an impactful meeting again. Uh, I'd like to congratulate the team led by Dr. Jiang Jin, Dr. Liu, yourself, and uh, congrats. And it's a great privilege for APSC to continue to have this uh, joint session. And I, I know structure is not a big space currently, but I, I think the future is very bright, especially all the stuff I saw coming up of China, new technology techniques, and the willingness to learn and improve. So I think we just have a brief uh, snapshot today. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers and panelists for their all their wonderful comments. We covered huge grounds. And I like this session because it covered the data on Terra tier, LA closure, and not forgetting that without imaging, we can't do anything for the mitral and tricuspid space. We still need a lot of uh, uh, sharing and improvement 
and hopefully new technology will refine and make it even more simple and uh, less of that learning curve that we all spoke about before we get good results for our patients. We are increasingly getting better and better based on discussion at patient selection for both the aortic mitral tricuspid space. I think to us, to me, that truly is a key to whether the outcome is good. So as we learn more together, this kind of sharing sessions, we hope to deliver the best care to our patients, both in APSC as well as in China as well. So with that, I would like to congratulate everyone and thank you for the privilege of sharing uh, in the joint session. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.